Community Safety Act, which ended the NYPD's stop, question, and frisk policy. Now, it's safe to say there was a lot of fear that if that bill passed, we could return New York to a more tumultuous and less safe time. Those fears proved unfounded. Jumani was right, and we are all the better for it. Our city became more fair while still remaining the safest big city in America. This is thanks in part to the vision of our public advocate and, of course, the incredible and tireless work of our police commissioner and the men and women of the NYPD. Jumani also served as chairman of the City Council's Housing and Buildings Committee, where he advocated for more targeted, affordable housing to help prevent communities from being priced out of the five boroughs. Now, I know there are people who think the public advocate role is more symbolic than it is substantive. I believe those critics lose sight of two things. First, the ability of somebody with true legislative chops and a citywide pulpit to be a real influence on our policy. And second, and this is a direct quote from our public advocate, there is power in symbolism, and I could not agree more. On the night he won his special election, he did not give a canned speech. And I know everybody in this room has heard a few canned political speeches, sometimes here in this room with Abney. That night, he discussed how therapy helped him become the person he is today. He talked about being a young man, crying at night, missing his father, and with the hopes that his story could assist other young men trying to find their space in the world. I have no doubt he reached both young men and women through that speech. And every time he joins fellow New Yorkers in protest or shares what it's like growing up with Tourette's syndrome, he encourages many more people to find their voice and their place in the world. Public Advocate Williams, we are excited to welcome you today, and we too look forward to being inspired. Now, one last point about our public advocate, Word on the street is that he is getting married. And last week, at a fundraiser for Jerry Nather, of all people, I met this incredible woman, which I realized that the public advocate like me is punching above his weight class in his marriage. <laughs> She's here today, India Sneed. She's a lawyer at Greenberg Trower, and we're happy to have you. And we want to say congratulations. Now to both of you, planning a wedding is complicated, and if you're having some trouble, Abney can be helpful. We know how to run a shindig. We design invites, we have a good list, we book calls, we know a lot of caterers, and we have plenty of people who'd be willing to give a bass man or maid of honor speech, but most of all, Bill Rudin does a mean hora. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to have our public advocate with us here today a passionate advocate for our city, ladies and gentlemen, Jumani Williams. Good morning, good morning. I can't even introduce my own fiance in Abney. <laughs> Thank you uh, to uh, Stephen for uh, that awesome introduction. You made me sound like a pretty dope guy. I appreciate that. Uh, and thank you to Executive Director Angela Pinsky. Thank you to the board and to everyone here today. Uh, you've already established protocol, but I do want to shout out my colleagues, Councilmember Drum and uh, Councilmember Keith. And uh, of course, our, I forgot your last name, man. It messed me up. I tried to, I tried to go by it. I got the first name, though. I said Keith. <laughs> and our commissioners, O'Neill and Lagos. Uh, my name is Jemani Williams, and as of February of this year, I am your public advocate of the city of New York. Thank you. Powers, Keith Powers, the guy came to me. <laughs> My goal is to use the breath and abilities of this office to help make New York an even better place for everyone, especially those who do not have a voice. Uh, my primary goal when I'm finished with this office is for no one to ever ask again why we need a public advocate's office. Since taking office, I've tackled more than a few issues, some you've seen in the media, others you don't hear about every day. New Yorkers, including advocating ways to address our city's affordable housing crisis, both on the city and state level, helping immigrant communities know their rights in the face of the federal government's ICE deportation of efforts, and addressing education inequality by pushing for reforms in our specialized high school admissions. While raising issues, amplifying voices, and yes, 
sometimes even getting arrested at the state capitol in the fight for stronger rent reforms, we've also been working to restructure and redefine the office of the public advocate in a way unlike before. We've also passed more pieces of legislation than all previous public advocates in their first 100 days combined, and we're working to make the office the strongest voice possible for New Yorkers. We're doing this by establishing new roles and creating opportunities to reach people where they are on the issues most important to them. We've created five new roles within the agency tasked with organizing and developing policy around vital issue areas in New York City. These deputy public advocates positions are designed in line with the model and vision I originally had for the office to bring the voice of New Yorkers to the forefront as an activist elected official. Today I want to talk to you about several key issues that you have heard about in the media, but first I want to make sure you understand what the office of the public advocate is. Of course, most people understand it to be uh, an abundsman. Uh, I make sure that we provide a check on the mayor, on the city council, and, and city agencies. We appoint people to commissions like the city planning commission. We can pass legislation. And as was mentioned, uh, the symbolism that is there is critically important, and using it to raise and lift the voices of people who feel unheard. I always feel like administrations, this one in particular, uh, but administrations in general have a tendency to do things to communities uh, instead of doing things with communities. And my hope as a public advocate office, as we shift from focus on legis of, of, of suing and legal matters uh, and in the courtroom, moving over to organizing. It made sense uh, because I'm an organizer, not an attorney, uh, as Tish James was. But I'm hoping to fill the gap where that information is not being flowing up and down uh, the way it should be. And I think we see that so often in important issues just like city council is going to be voting on Rikers Island uh, tomorrow and Thursday, I feel that conversation could have gone a lot better had there been a better way to engage the communities uh, from the bottom up. Now I want to, thank you. Uh, now I want to discuss some of the major things our office has recently focused on that you may have heard about, including our office's recent report regarding the safety and handling of members of our community suffering from severe mental illness or mental health issues, and our efforts to advance a bill that would create paid time off for our employees who toil in oftentimes 24-7 work environment. In the last three years, 14 people, mothers, sons, brothers, sisters living with severe mental illness were killed in encounters with police. Why is this important? First, because they are human beings. And police should be focused on policing. We very often ask the commissioner and police to do the jobs that so many other agencies should be doing. That is unfair to the police and is unfair to the communities that they are policing. Especially as recent events make us more vulnerable to domestic international terrorism. If your bottom line is the most important thing to you, think about the impact on the local economy, people suffering with mental illness, our family and friends and family of friends. I'm working to improve mental health outcomes for all New Yorkers because without healthy individuals, we lack a healthy community. I also want to make sure uh, we don't always merge mental health and mental illness. I believe all of us has, should have a mental health check-in at some point. Just because you have a mental health check-in doesn't mean you have a mental illness, and we have to start treating them as if they're the same. And if you have a mental illness, you do need acute care. A community under stress cannot thrive. It hurts families and the interests of everyone in this room from your home to your business. For these and other reasons, my office issued a report that made a number of recommendations for a city, hopefully re reduce the interactions between police and people with severe mental illness who are in acute stress. Reducing the number of mental health crises by investing in mental health care centers. Reducing the number of police responses to such crises by introducing a new number replacing 911 for responses to such emergencies so people can get the health response they need, not a criminal one. Evaluating models that provide a non-police response to acute medical crisis. If we are serious about change, we have to go bold if we are to go at all. New York City police officers should not be in the business of mental health care. Most of them aren't trained to do so, and it's unfair to them, as I mentioned, in the community. The mayor also pledged to open 90 shelters by 2022, particularly for men. To date, 27 have been opened. Getting people off the streets is critical for our city, but this is a farce if no services are attached to keep people off the streets. So as we think about our quality of life, I want you to think about paid time off, Bill, I introduced five years ago. 
I do want to thank the mayor for bringing this up and bringing it back to the spotlight and to the city council for taking up the mantle uh, of a bill I introduced five years ago as New York City Council member. Putting this bill forward acknowledges our employees are human beings who need time off, especially at a time when the 40-hour work week is becoming extinct and many people are working well past. Our current work culture places value in a 24-hour workday, and the time for paid time off is here. A healthier workforce is a more productive workforce. For that reason, this bill as written now would provide, would require private employees with five or more employers to offer 80 hours of paid vacation time per year based on accrual. Employees would have not provide Employers would have to provide written notice of employees' rights as well as their accrual and usage of paid personal time, protection employees from being retaliated against for seeking their right for paid time off. As I mentioned, that's where the bill is now. I have full faith that it will change as the discussions we are having are moving forward. I have met with stakeholders from employees and advocates to large corporations and small business owners to discuss this legislation. I have heard valid concerns in including reduction in workforce hours, this being added to burdensome fines and already high rents. I want people to remember, I was also a small business owner. Uh, I didn't work like many of you in the room, it failed, uh, but you guys were successful. Uh, but I believe it's still the right thing to do. I often use my experiences that people don't know about, whether it's being a landlord or being a former small business owner, when I'm introducing have in legislation and having these discussions. It's also why I'm determined to have as many stakeholders as possible at the table to discuss how we get this bill right. Contrary to what some people think, I believe it's imperative that elected officials listen to and hear what everyone has to say. Instead of doing things to the community, we should be doing things with the community. It's important that everybody's in this room. It's important that people who are in this room find a way because I think we all have the same goals. Uh, I think we all want to make sure that all young people have a safe place to learn and grow. I think everyone wants their children to do a little bit better than they did. Everyone wants to have a safe place to live uh, and everybody, and affordable, and everybody wants to have good food on the table. How we get there is what's critically important. And I believe my job and government's job is to find the barriers that are preventing people from doing that and getting those barriers out of the way but we have to do it together. I've spoken for a while now, uh, but in closing, I'd like to say I'm eager and want to hear from you. Uh, you're in the audience because like me, you want an even better New York. Like some people in the room, we may disagree on some things, but we can still work together. Thank you so much for this time, and I'm looking forward to answering all your questions. Thank you so much. You mentioned uh, the mental health facilities and how we need to uh, expand them and open more. And obviously there's a lot of pushback from local communities, a lot of nimbyism. Can you talk about how we're going to get there? I think there's a lot of different um, ways that we can get there. There's always nimbyism. But there, there are right now, if you have, um, if you, somebody gets, God forbid, cut or something, we can go to an emergency room. Uh, there, we don't really have those things for, for mental health. Uh, particularly if you have an acute crisis at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning, oftentimes there's no place to go. So we can uh, use HHC uh, in a way that we haven't before to ask them to have uh, emergency room uh, place centers like we do for physical structures. There's a lot of urgent cares that are opening up. We might be able to partner with some of them uh, to be able to provide some of this. And the city, I think, is moving in, in this direction uh, already. And we, we have to, um, there, there is just no choice. But there's always gonna be nimbyism. My hope is that we don't force these things on the communities, but we have to have a discussion with the communities. Uh, of course, we have to move forward, irrespective of if no community board wants it, but, but oftentimes we're kind of just shoving it down folks' throat. But, but it is part of a broader, a broader preventative. Like, so most, many people are focused on the acute time that someone calls but we have to focus on what happens before that. And so we want to prevent the acute, acuteness from happening. And if we have respite care, if we have an infrastructure that doesn't exist now, uh, it will be much better. So I don't know if I answered it fully, how to get there, uh, but I know that we have to, we have no choice.
So, uh, as you know, uh, the 2020 census is a priority for Abney, and I know it is a priority for your office, and thank you for uh, giving it to your first public uh, deputy, uh, public advocate. Could you tell us a little bit about how Abney can work with your office to make sure that each and every New Yorker is counted in the uh, 2020 census? Well, usually, I mean, I don't know if there's Trump supporters in the room, but usually I ask folks, if you really dislike and are not happy with uh, Donald Trump, fill out your census. And that's the, that's the number one way to help get back. If you do support Donald Trump, you should fill it out anyway. Um, but it is, uh, we have to make sure that folks understand how critically important it is. And I don't think most people do at this moment in time. Um, and the, I'm thankful for the city has put a tremendous amount of money uh, into it. The state has put some. I'm not sure that the uh, governor has released all of it yet, but we have to make sure, um, he, he often does things like that. But uh, we, are, we have to make sure that the money is going to community groups and people who are culturally sensitive so that we can reach the hardest to reach folks, uh, like particularly uh, undocumented uh, New Yorkers who the president was trying to frighten into not filling out, but so far we've won that and we have to make sure that they need to fill it out. And folks who don't know, Brooklyn, Kings County uh, had the lowest response rate of the entire nation uh, last time. Uh, that's a problem. And so we want to make sure we get out there in a uh, language that people understand in a culturally sensitive uh, way. And I think Abney is, is very well suited to do that because of the breadth and um, different types of organizations and agencies that are here to get that message across. And contrary to, to popular belief, by the time people are knocking on doors, uh, the majority of people have responded. And so the knocking on doors that people commonly think of with the census is the cleanup. And so we want to make sure people are filling it out uh, online and when they get it in the mail long before the people are knocking on doors. It's critically important. We all know why here. We get our funding stream from that. We get our representation from that. We have to do a good job of messing that messaging that into what people care about locally. Um, that's the best way to do it. My name is David Condliffe. I'm the executive director of the Center for Community Alternatives. You recently visited Syracuse because you wanted to witness a project called Freedom Commons. It's a partnership between the Syracuse Housing Authority and CCA, the Center for Community Alternatives. It's the first time in the nation that a public housing authority has partnered with a group like CCA or the Fortune Society or others to actually welcome people home from prison because that's how we will make projects safer instead of excluding people by welcoming them and supporting them. My question to you, yes, we should all applaud that. That's correct, George. My question to you is whether having observed that, we have a lot of real estate people in the room whether you believe that we could be replicating projects like that in New York City, and whether the New York City Housing Authority should take a more affirmative role in issuing an RFP to use some of that vacant land they have for projects like that instead of privatizing it. It was fascinating. I had never seen anything like it. Um, again, surprise, treating people like human beings uh, can be successful. And I got to give the, the governor um, his credit here, uh, the way that state agencies combined to, which I thought was fantastic, uh, to apply for funding uh, was something I hadn't seen in a long time. And I did bring it back to my team to try to see if it's something we can replicate here in New York City. Uh, in Syracuse, there is a, a lot larger amount of land uh, to use, so it, it will be interesting to figure out how we can do it here in, in New York City. Uh, but I think there are ways that we can do it. Um, there's ways that I think we can even look at uh, NYCHA land uh, to, I think, uh, do some of what they're trying to do through RAD and privatization. Uh, we can maybe look at it uh, to do what, what I saw up in Syracuse. But it was fantastic. And it's very important to me that we focus on housing in a way we haven't. Supportive housing for people returning, supportive housing with people um, who have um, uh, mental health challenges. Uh, we have a homelessness crisis uh, that has spiked uh, and I think is, is, is kind of out of control. And the number one answer to most issues of homelessness is housing. I mean, there are subsets of domestic violence, of uh, substance abuse and mental health, but, but the vast majority of people simply need a place to live. And so the short answer is yes. I gave you the long one, but the short answer is yes. I work with Coalition for the Homeless. Um, we applaud the mayor for all he has done to address the homeless crisis, but as you mentioned, 
nearly half of the families who, the people who are in homeless shelters are families, and most of them actually do have um, hourly paying jobs. So there really is an affordability crisis. Um, we've been trying to advocate for the How's Our Future New York campaign, which you thankfully have supported. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, so we're, we're advocating for an increase in uh, affordable housing units uh, in about 30,000 uh, new new construction. I'm wondering how you think the, the Public Advocates Office can help continue to spur this conversation forward so that there's additional action, considering that homelessness is at um, the same record highs as it was in the Great Depression. You know, I was a uh, tenant community organizer. Uh, I always make it clear it was before Barack Obama. Uh, so nobody knew what it was. And uh, my mother asked me to please get a real job. And I was trying to explain to her that organizing was a real job. And I did focus a lot on housing. So I've been working on housing issues for, for a couple of decades. I got to give a shout out you know, to the state, yes, to the assembly, uh, but really to the state senate for pushing a bunch of bills that I've been working on for almost 20 years. And a lot of people in the housing industry have been that I think is phenomenal. Uh, there's probably some in the room that disagree with me. Uh, but I think we had a, a phenomenal um, time dealing with these issues in the state. And that's because uh, preservation is probably the number one thing we can do. Uh, we're never going to build our way out of the problem, so we got to preserve the affordability that we have. And so those bills um, help do that. But also, I, I, I'm frustrated because I don't think we're using all the tools that we can. Uh, again, there are some that are going to disagree with me, but uh, I think MIH was an utter failure. Uh, I think the mayor was wrong for pushing it forward, and the council was wrong for adopting it. I'm one of the few who voted against it. We're basically bringing in more uh, market rate units than anything else, and that's, that's not going to solve the problem. So my hope is that we actually uh, reopen MIH and fix it. It's mandatory inclusionary housing. It's the underpinning of all the rezonings that are going on. I've asked for a moratorium on MIH rezonings until we fix it. I also have a bill asking for a uh, racial impact study to be done before any rezoning happens and uh, fit it inside the environmental impact study so that we can truly understand what's going on. And also trying my best to help communities understand how difficult it is sometimes, even though we understand the problem. And so there's three questions I usually ask. I don't know if it'll work here, but I'm, I'm gonna, I'll try here. And the first is, who believes, simple, who believes homelessness is a, a critical issue right now? Just please raise your hand. And who believes that the answer to most of the homeless issues is housing that they can't afford? Please raise your hand. And then who wants a taller building next to where they live? And so this, I see you, Regis. <laughs> but this, the answers to those three questions are the same wherever you go in the city, regardless of race, religion, uh, socioeconomic status. And it shows the difficulty of getting what we need to answer some of the problems. You have to have the community to be a part of where that density is going to go. You can't tell them where it's going to go. What do we do? Like what practical, what do you think can get the mayor's office from where it is today up to that 90? And is it even remotely possible we hit that by 2022? I really think the answer is getting more units online uh, that people can afford. As I mentioned, uh, the majority of people who are homeless are actually are families, a third are children. Most of them are working. A lot of them are city employees. So we have people who are working for the city and can't find a place to live. And so that takes a combination of uh, real estate folks uh, getting together and saying we're not going to make every dollar humanly possible. Um, it makes the unions coming in to uh, say we're going to uh, try to work on a rate that everyone can agree with so we can get this affordability. And it takes the government uh, coming in and helping buy down uh, these projects. All of those things have to happen. We have to focus on that first. But even if we agree to all of the units that we need right now, we're going to need shelters. And so there's just no, no if, ands, and about it. But we do have to have those tough conversations. And it also, I mean, I actually don't mind uh, kind of shining a light on how people actually think, because everybody wants something to happen except right next to them, as uh, I, just w I just showed with the three questions. And the same goes for the homeless shelter. And so I think that's important that people see, you know, out of the, the you know, I think it's 51, community, uh, 51 districts and community boards, it's very hard to cite these. And so we just have to move forward with the discussion. But even in that, there's oftentimes the city comes in and says we're going to cite it here. 
and when if you talk to the community, they may actually have another location that works that more people would accept. And so it's those kind of things that we have to make sure we include in the conversations. I, I just don't know why we don't. Like we always come in, we're going to put it here, we've done our work, we've decided, and the community's like, well, if you'd only spoken to us, uh, we would have told you that this was a bad location for a particular reason, and here's another space. Um, but the, the real struggle with all of these things, from bike lanes to shelters, is we just have no master plan in the city. And so we're doing things piecemeal. We're, we're putting bike lanes here, or we're not talking to the people who are doing housing, not talking to the people who are doing shelters, not talking to the people who are doing a whole host of things. And my hope is that somebody just sets up and says, we're going to do a master plan that has all these things overlaid with, uh, with one another. And I think that will really help guide a conversation uh, a lot better. In that case, with that, I'm going to say we look forward to your master plan. Because <laughs> I kind of get the feeling if you don't do it, I'm not sure we're going to get one right now. Uh, but I want to say thank you to the public advocate. Thank you all for coming here today. Great call.